Hi, everybody. This is Stephanie Luper. Thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we peel back the layers of what we think we know and attempt to get to the deepest understanding we can of what it means to be human. Today is episode 15, and in episode 15, we have on Marcelo Gleiser, who is a theoretical physicist and also a very popular science writer. He's written five books, and he works at our, some of our biggest questions. He calls them the three origin questions, uh, the beginning of life, the beginning of cosmos, the beginning of mind. And he's brilliant, and he has a lot of very interesting ideas, not just about, not just scientific concepts, but about science itself. So I'm super super honored and, and really excited to be able to uh, have him on as a part of our project. So I actually first encountered Professor Gleiser's work here at Oxford. He was doing a talk with one of my supervisors, who is a famous theologian. His name is Alistair McGrath. And the two of them did a little bit of a dialogue on what we can do about uncertainty. How do we manage uncertainty? How do we manage the fact that we don't really have all the answers? How do we make sense of how science fits into that? And they both had very different views, of course, but really complimentary and respectful and super fascinating. And everything that Marcelo said lined up a lot with my own personal work on sort of reimagining science and coming to understand just how little it can actually give us in terms of like really secure knowledge. Uh, and so it was uh, such, such an honor really um, to meet him. So I, I want to read you a little bit about him, but he's, he's everywhere and he does so many things. And so this very little short little bio that I have here is uh, of course inadequate to the, the, the piles of things that he has done. Marcelo Gleiser is a theoretical physicist at Dartmouth College where I did my undergrad, specializing in particle cosmology, mixing the physics of the very smallest constituents of the universe with the physics of the universe as a whole. To make sense of the world and our place in the grand scheme of things, he studies the emergence of complex structures in nature, focusing on very fundamental questions related to what he calls the three origins questions, as I mentioned, cosmos, life, and mind. Now, he's also the author of several books, uh, many of which I have read and adore, um, the Island of Knowledge, A Tear at the Edge of Creation, The Dancing Universe, The Prophet, and The Astronomer. And there's one about fishing, the simple beauty of the unexpected, about his experiences of fishing. Um, and I will link to all those in the show notes. They're, again, they're really brilliant books. And so I don't want to ramble on too long because I want to bring him on. Uh, we'll just be talking about the nature of science, nature of questions, what can we know, what can we not know, and what this all means for his relationships with mystery and his spiritual life, because in, in that sense, he is a very deeply spiritual person. So it'll, it'll be a really exciting chat. Uh, thank you a lot. And here we go. So welcome, Marcelo. Uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm really, really excited to have you here. I love what you do. You know that I love what you do. And I was just rambling for a few minutes about how much I love what you do earlier. Um, but <laughs> do you want to tell us a little bit more about sure. what you do and why you do it? So, okay. So um, there are many different areas where I'm working, you know, so I am, of course, a theoretical physicist. And uh, first and foremost, what I do is research, mostly focused on cosmology and what I would call the big questions related to the universe, you know, the origin of the universe, the origin of matter in the universe, the origin of structure, meaning, you know, how the galaxies appeared and things like that. Um, and lately I've been interested in applying concepts from information theory to these things. So, you know, if, you know we live in the age of information, so everything is somewhat decodable in terms of information and hence, of course, the universe, as we gather data about its properties, basically that data is information about the universe. So, so how can you use information theory to kind of single out or extract hidden patterns mm -hmm. that you couldn't otherwise, you know? And that's essentially what we're looking at. So, for example, one of the most impressive signatures of the universe when it was still a little baby it's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is essentially a signature from when the first atoms were made, the first hydrogen atoms. So you had protons and electrons and light 
you're all interacting with one another, sort of like a love triangle. And then eventually the protons and the electrons got together, formed hydrogen, and the photons kind of lost the love triangle and started to stream freely across the universe. And they left a pattern that is very sensitive to where matter was. And so we have a picture of these things. And, um, and the picture of these things tells you a little bit about the universe when it was only 400,000 years old, which compared to 14 billion, it's really early infancy here, right? It's not even a toddler. And, uh, and that tells us what was going on there. And it's patterns, and because it's patterns, it has information. And so we've been trying to extract some abnormalities in those patterns that can tell us a little bit about secrets that could be hidden you know, in the early physics of the universe. And that's what I've been spending a lot of my research time these days as a physicist. But then, of course, there is also uh, my work as a director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement, which right now is going through its third and last, first, third and last year of its first round. And I'm right now trying very hard to extend its life by talking to funders. And this is sort of like the, the real kind of life of a senior professor, which is not just doing the beautiful big questions, but actually raising money for others to work with him you know, to do these things. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to keep doing this and it's going to get even better in time. Um, and then, of course, there is my work as a, shall I say, public intellectual, you know, as a scientist very much engaged in public understanding of science and the role of, 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 of science in the general culture of our times and how we can create bridges between what we do here in academia and the general public so that the conversation becomes more open and democratic and accessible and not just like, you know, closed off, you know, within <laughs> yeah. the walls of, of knowledge, so to speak, you know. And in that, um, I just finished a paper, an essay with two other guys. One is Adam Frank, who is a theoretical astrophysicist, but also a guy that I've been working on for a long time in many things. And this wonderful philosopher of mine called Evan Thompson mm -hmm. on um, what's wrong with science these days. <clears throat> you know, and essentially what we do, and this is an asset who is coming out at Aeon, you know, the magazine Aeon, the online magazine Aeon. Mm -hmm. It's coming out on January 8th. So very fresh news here. It just got accepted yesterday, and uh, it's called The Blind Spot. And it's essentially about, it's a critique of how science is completely blind to the fact that a lot of what we do depends in a very fundamental way on how we are part of the observation process. So like experience, human experience is very much part of everything that we do in terms of how we relate to nature, how we do research about nature, how we collect data, how we think about the universe. And yet we have this kind of naive dream that um, we can somehow extract ourselves from all this and have like a God's view of, of reality, which is independent of the human factor. And we call that the blind spot because obviously it is just not that way. And what we do is when we identify the problem um, and illustrate it in terms of a few examples, you know, where it's kind of obvious that we're stuck in science, one of them being the origin of the universe, the other one being uh, quantum physics as the interpretation of quantum mechanics, you know, what is going on at the level of atomic and subatomic reality and consciousness. <clears throat> And so we go into these three topics and show how the level of experience is really um, a kind of a irreducible part of the problem, that you cannot extricate the human factor from the way we understand or think about reality in any sort of way. Um, and so we hope we're going to make a lot of noise with this. Um, it's going to upset a lot of people because... A lot of people are going to be very sensitive to this and imagine that we're actually criticizing science. And we're not criticizing science, you know, as scientists, because it turns out that two out of three of the authors are practicing scientists. 
But what we're doing is we are kind of raising awareness to the fact that this sort of idea that science can do all, this scientific triumphalism mm -hmm. that some people defend out there is just complete nonsense. And, and in a sense, by trying to exploit this issue, we are actually humanizing science, you know, making science more into a part of a human enterprise as opposed to a God-given truth about the world, which mm. it's not there anyways. Yeah, that's, I, I think that that's incredibly important. That makes, I'm curious then, and I think that this will be a question that many scientists, this will be like a core of what they're pushing back on. So if science is not an arbiter of objective truth, then what kind of truth does science give us? Right. So it does, does gives us the best truth that we can extract. Um, so the notion that um, there's a final truth about things you have to be very careful because obviously if I pick up a pen, you know, at a certain height and I release the pen from that certain height, I can obviously use Galileo's free fall result and calculate exactly how long is it going to take for the pen to hit the ground depending on how high it goes. So is that true? Yeah, that's true. But, but that's kind of a silly truth, you know, it's true because what's behind it is really what's important. It's the model. And so what is the model? Well, you know, Galileo didn't really have a model. His was a completely empirical description of just do it. Then Newton had a model where he said, well, you have the earth, it has a mass, and the pen has a mass. They attract each other with this force. So it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two. And hence, using that model, I can describe this motion, right? Is that true? Well, it's an approximation to the truth because then you go on to Einstein and Einstein says, well, no, there is no force. There's just curvature of space. And what's going on is that the pen is responding to the curvature of space created by, by the mass of the earth. And hence what we call gravity is really related to the geometry of space. And is that the truth? Well, that's the best truth we have right now. So it's not so much about the empirical result of a given experiment, which yes, it's true, it's gonna happen. You know, if you jump off from a window, you're gonna fall, no questions about that. Is that true? Yeah, it's true, but that's not the point. Is the model of reality behind the description of the phenomenon that really matters? And that one has no final answer. No, no. final answer ever, period. Yes, because you can never be sure that you got to it, you know, because when you say, hey, you know, you go from, from Aristotle to Galileo to Newton to Einstein, are you getting closer to the truth? Maybe, but it's sort of like one of those asymptotic approaches, you know, like you may be, but then Einstein has to be corrected. And we know that from everything that we know nowadays, it has to be failing at the level very close to the origin of the universe and when very small distances are concerned because it doesn't incorporate quantum effects, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a problem with gravity right there. So very possibly Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity will be expanded to become something else. And we cannot know if there'll ever be a, an end to this for the very simple reason that we can never know all there is to know about reality. And that to me is humbling, but also very inspiring, right? And, uh, and, and that's the point. So yes, I can, I can very much say that as long as we humans or whatever succeeds us, you know, eventually maybe something else, but have a probe to reality that depends on technologies, mm -hmm. like use instruments to do stuff, right? And those instruments, even though they're awesome, et cetera, et cetera, they all have limits of precision, of range. There's always something beyond that is hiding, right? And that something beyond that is hiding could reveal a whole other aspect of reality that is completely unexpected and unpredictable at the point that we are right now. Right, but it's, it's really, really popular right now to think that we're going to come up with a theory of everything, right? 
yeah, it's popular, but it's just epistemologically wrong. So, <laughs> I agree. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it may be popular, and it's mostly popular with scientists, mostly physicists, that don't really think philosophically about what they're doing. They just have the sort of the snowplow approach, you know, like, let's do this, you know, and, uh, and, and let's calculate. It doesn't really matter what's going on. We just calculate. But what has happened is that in the last, what, 30 years, my whole, basically my scientific career, when I was doing my PhD in England in the 80s, mid 80s, string theory was the thing to do. So I did it, you know, because it was awesome, beautiful, elegant, spectacular, right? And obviously true because it was symmetric and beauty and symmetry, all these things, you know. So uh, there was an aesthetic judgment going on there that nature is beautiful because it is ultimately symmetric and it is hidden in this beautiful symmetry that we're going to find unification of the four forces of nature. And boy, how could you resist that? I mean, it's such a wonderful thing to do, right? I mean, to go and live the ultimate platonic dream of finding the design of nature, you know, using geometry. So you dive into that, you know, head first. And, um, and that's what a lot of people did. And that's been a long time. And those models, they make predictions. They are based on certain assumptions like there should be a bunch of particles called supersymmetric particles that should be observed. They have not been observed. There should be extra dimensions of space. They're very hard to observe, but maybe, obviously they haven't been observed. And, and so the problem is that all this sort of empirical signatures that would make us go forward with these ideas have not been vindicated. So we are right now living a very interesting moment in, in theoretical higher energy physics where you kind of have a split. The people are saying, you know what? Forget it, guys. It's not happening. There's no supersymmetry. Look, we can't find it. It's been hiding. We've got this big machine, the LHC at CERN in Switzerland. Been probing for decades. Can't find anything. Dark matter, which is supposed to be coming from the sky, should be supersymmetric. It hasn't been, it hasn't been found at all. Give it up. Do not assume that our aesthetic sensitivities are somehow embraced by nature or our expectations. You know, just forget it. Nature is what it is. The role of science is not to dictate how nature is, but to describe how nature is. And, and then you have the hardcore camp that says, no, no, it's there. We just can't see it. We just need machines with even higher energy and higher energy. And the problem with these theories is you can never kill them. Mm. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the little Fantasia by Disney when Mickey Mouse is learning, you know, how to become a, a, a wizard and he chops the, 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 chops the broom and then you have two brooms and then you keep chopping the broom and there's more brooms and you can never get rid of the brooms and you get more and more of them. Yes. That's more or less what's going on, you know, because you just can't kill this because you can always push the level of empirical validation beyond what you can see. That sounds like religion to me, mm. you know, because you can always push. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you see God? No. But you don't need to see God to believe in it. And so you kind of get confused about what is it that we're doing here. And to me, given I have a, lot, a finite lifetime and I want to kind of understand things as best as I could, what our experiments are telling us is that those final dreams of a beautiful theory of nature don't make any sense from just this empirical validation perspective. And then, as I explained, in my book, The Island of Knowledge, where I go into this, actually I wrote two books. One is a direct critique of this notion of symmetry as beauty. In fact, it's an elegy to asymmetry and imperfection as the real driving mechanism behind nature, not symmetry, because you need imbalance in order to create. You need asymmetry in order to create. And this is mm. revealed in many, many aspects of, of reality, you know, physical and biological too. Um, and so that was called a pair at the edge of creation. 
And then I wrote this other book called The Island of Knowledge, which is really an examination of why any sort of ideas related to final answers must be wrong by definition, you know, because you can never be sure as a human probing nature that you have a final answer about anything. Yes, and, and these books are great, and I highly recommend people um, purchase them. So where, where do you think this obsession with final answers comes from? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, it comes from 3,000 years of monotheistic thinking. You know, if you yeah. think about um, where things um, originated, you know, the, as soon as we went from a polytheistic to a monothe monotheistic religion. So um, we had, at some point in Egypt, Akhenaton, one of the pharaohs, decided that there is only one God. And of course, it only lasted for his reign, but still <coughs> was one moment in which that happened. And then you had a few other instances, but it really caught hold with, um, with obviously with Jews with the Jewish uh, Old Testament, and then of course the Christian uh, New Testament, the notion that everything is God and God is one and God is everything. So the idea that one can synthesize all and can be omnipresent and omniscient is a very, very powerful idea. And, uh, and hence, it's something that has permeated our culture for a very long time. And I think if you look at, say, the patriarchs of modern science, if you even look at Newton um, and you look at how he wrote, you know, so his books are very interesting, especially the mathematical principles um, of natural philosophy, because the core is very, very scientific, very mathematical, and very hard to read. But then he has the beginning and mostly the end where he actually goes philosophical and he contextualizes what he's trying to do. And it's obvious from what he's trying to do that what he's trying to do is, is to really decode the way God created the universe. You know, that, is, that was his mission, mm -hmm. right? And so the idea of the scientist as the coder of God's mind is incredibly powerful. And, and, and it comes back, it comes all the way from shamanistic notions, you know, that there was a translator between the gods and the people. And that was the holy man that could decipher the skies or, or is a volcano or whatever it is that is happening and tell the people what to do, sacrifices, harvest givings, whatever, in order to appease the gods. That sort of role you know, went on and became the scientist's role in the Renaissance as the guy who could re interpret the mind of God to tell the people how the world was viewed. So it was science as devotion. Mm -hmm. And even though, of course, this whole notion has been exercised, you know, during the, especially during the Enlightenment in the 18th century, and there was a very, very abrupt and clear separation between what natural philosophers and theologians and philosophers did. The aspirations, and these are very subjective aspirations of a scientist as being a person capable mm -hmm. of going deep into the secrets of nature and hence finding truth with a capital T where others cannot is very, very strong. And mm -hmm. at this aspiration to Occam's razor, which is this concept in science where I think he was actually, William of Ockham was an Oxford scholar from the 13th century um, or 14th, I'm not quite sure, um, where he says that given two explanations to the same phenomenon, the simplest is one that is always true. So the idea that there is simplicity, and of course, if you have a multiplicity of forces in nature, what is the simplest thing? Well, it's to have one, right? So you put these two things together and you get this extremely strong intellectual and emotional appeal of a monotheistic science, i.e., you know, the unification or theory of everything kind of science. 
Mm -hmm. And so your perspective that knowledge is incomplete and, and that science advances into incompleteness and even creates more questions, is this, this is uncomfortable for people? And do you think you envision a world in which it isn't uncomfortable because we had a different history or we go through some cultural changes and somehow we arrive at an ability to sit with this kind of ambiguity? You know, it's uncomfortable because if you are emotionally built to kind of fulfill a sort of noble quest for truth and final truth, and it's very hard to deal with the fact that it's not there because some people base their whole lives, their whole careers on this quest, right? And so it's, it's sort of saying, I'm going to devote my whole life to find the Holy Grail. And damn, they, and then somebody says, look, there is no Holy Grail. Sorry, dude. And you've done that for 30, 40 years. And you say, no, no, I can't believe that. I'm going to die with this idea that there is a Holy Grail, right? And if you look at Stephen Hawking's old, uh, last book, he, he did that. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, well, he says, I will recant my early statements that we are there already. We are not there, but we will get there. So, meaning he never gave up, you know, um, because it is really hard emotionally to give up. It's devastating to sort of give up on a whole life's quest you know, mm -hmm. and, and accept that this is not the way to go, right? And then they will come to me and say, how the heck do you know, you know? And I'm like saying, I don't know. But what I do know is that the notion of finding final answers is just wrong. Philosophically, it does not make sense just from the very way that science works and the very way that we humans interact with reality. So that one, I, you know, I... I'm conf very confident about. And uh, so, yes, people get upset about this and they call it a defeatist position. You're just giving up because you couldn't do it. I'm like, no, no, that is not the point. <laughs> yes, I couldn't do it, but I couldn't do it because no one can do it because it's undoable. You know, it's basically an unknowable aspect of, of, of life, which is something hard to embrace. So, yes, my crusade, as you said, uh, is to kind of create a new, or try to create a new way of thinking about the world, about our interactions with the world, so that embracing the fact that we can do wonderful things, but we can only do so many things and understand so many things is not a failure, but is actually an inspiration. You know, and this sort of change in mindset is... It's hard to do, it's hard to accept, but I'm hoping that the new generation of physicists and scientists in general and philosophers um, will accept this in a much easier way. Right, because in another light, right, I, there's this scientific triumphalism, and I love that you use that word, it's all over my dissertation. There's this triumphalism and the excitement comes from sort of, it's almost like anthropocentric, like it's about glorifying our ability to know, right? To dominate knowledge. But you're saying that there's this excitement that we can also have about adventuring continuously yeah. in, into a, a perpetually unknown and sort of in that way, almost seductive, you know, um, elusive universe. Yes, absolutely, right? I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I use, if, you, if you're a climber, right? And you're going to conquer this hard mountain and you say, you know, I'm going to dedicate my life to conquer that hard, the high mountain. And you go and you climb and you climb and you become a very good, you know, technically good climber. And then you hit the top of the mountain and then you look around and you go, oh no, look at all these higher mountains that I haven't even started climbing yet, you know? And, and so you have two options. One is you sit down on the ground and cry, you know, because you thought this was it. And no, it's not. Or you go, all right, no problem. I'm still alive. I'm going to go and try to climb these other mountains and keep going and going. And to me, that's the best. And when we get to the real highest peak, then all you have to do is look up. And then you have the whole universe to explore. So to me, that's, that's the essence of humanity, you know, is to kind of 
not put your goals into a final achievable objective, but to actually understand that there is no final achievable objective. There is the refinement of the quest. <clears throat> and, and, you know, and I sort of went through this transition at a personal level, you know, because I was one of the finalists, you know, yes, we're going to get to the end of it. And look, my thesis is about this and I've written all these papers and yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually, um, after so many years doing this, I became much more aware of the silliness of the whole enterprise, really, and saying, that is not what it's about, you know? And, and since then, and I would say this transition has happened, I guess, about uh, perhaps about 10 years ago, mostly, or maybe a little more than that, 15. Mm. And it just became stronger, and I found a voice where I can actually express what I'm trying to say in ways that a lot of people understand and relate to, especially millennials. There's something generational about this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's much easier for younger people to understand where this is coming from. You know, that there's no perfection, there is no finalist goal, there is inequality, there is imbalance, there is imperfection. And we just find a niche and go for the things we can do as best as possible mm. and have fun and joy in the process. It's all about fun and joy in the process, you know, and, and I, God, you know, I remember giving talks and seminars and I, it still happens, but now I, I know how to deal with this much better. But when I was younger, you go and give talks at MIT or Princeton or Harvard or whatever. And those physicists looked all unhappy. You know, like they've taken away the joy out of the process and it becomes so like, oh, you know, and I'm so smart and I know all the things. And of course you don't. Mm -hmm. you know? And and um, and I look at this now and I smile, you know, because I say, boy, guys, life is so much more interesting than this. And and because it is not about the victory at the end, you know, it's not a game where there is a final result. It's about the playing. <clears throat> and I feel much better about everything now. And in fact, when I do give a talk and I still encounter, encounter one of these older fellows with this sort of grumpy, old, I know everything attitude, I almost laugh, you know, and I feel kind of a little bit sorry because I kind of remember <laughs> a, 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 a sentence my, my, my grandfather used to say, which is, if you wear a hat bigger than your head, it covers your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, these guys are just wearing these very big hats and missing the point that we do this because it's a joyful thing, that we do it because we love nature and we don't do it to conquer. We do it because the process is just fun and enlightening, enlightening to us. You know, we actually do learn about nature but we also learn about ourselves in the process and that to me is what it's all about it's so beautiful i have like a million questions oh. and i'm i was i'm going to be able to go back and pull out some really nice quotes for you um yeah. <laughs> send them over for publicity so um would you know what it was for you that catalyzed this awakening um that's a very good question, you know, and let me, let me, um, let me say that it wasn't a particular moment of enlightenment, like I was walking in a snowy field one, you know, and then, you know, I saw the burning bush and I understood it all kind of thing. It was not like that. Um, I think it was more a maturing of what was going on. And I guess, one thing that allowed me to do this, which I consider kind of being lucky, is the fact that as a teacher, I don't only teach very hardcore technical courses, but I also teach courses for the humanities. So, you know, the so-called physics for poets classes, um, um, which by the way, I'm going to, I have a YouTube channel now, I'm becoming very modern. And, um, and I'm going to create a YouTube channel, Physics for Poets class, you know, free and open to the public. But, That's nice. 
but um, the idea is that um, I was exposed to more fundamental questions about existence that kind of changed the way I look at life. And so that was one thing. The other thing that has happened is that I was, and this is a very personal statement that I think is very important, which is I was exposed to death at a very early age because my mother died when I was six years old. And I think that completely framed the way I looked at life. You know, after a very, very dark time in my teenage years, I realized that I had two choices. You know, one is darkness, the other one was light. And I chose light. I chose light, but with an awareness of the finiteness of humanity, human life, always in my mind. And, um, and in so when I look at people's seriousness in trying to get to the truth, you know, I find that kind of sad because it gives a color to whatever you do that is only black and white, you know, because either you get to it or you don't get to it. And life is so much richer than that. You know, it's really all different shades. And once I realized that, you know, and it was a growing process, I kind of exercised this notion of all is one and your goal is to find the one, you know, to realize, no, all is many, you know, and you're part of the many. And, uh, and, and being part of the many is a much more enriching way of living a life than being part of a monolithic one. And so I embraced this and decided to think more broadly about what physics really meant as opposed to pursuing a particular point of view and started doing other things which are more physical. I had, I was an athlete when I was younger and then I stopped being an athlete and, uh, pretty much, apart from the occasional jogging around. And in my late 40s, early 50s, I really became an athlete again. And, and, and this sort of physical endurance that I embraced kind of complemented the intellectual endurance that you do as a scientist. Mm. And I find that they speak to one another in a very wonderful way. And it sort of made me understand that, you know, Life starts, you know, at the end of your comfort zone kind of thing. And, 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 and not just physically, but intellectually as well. So pushing your, questioning what you believe in and your MO is really essential to kind of enrich yourself as a person and to change. And changing is so fundamental in life, you know, to try to change, to try to redefine who you are. Right? And to see things in different ways and to tease yourself, to get out of this comfort zone of this is what I believe in and that's all there is. No, no, no. You know, go out there and, and push yourself. And by doing that, you are pushing your horizons and I think very much enriching the way you think about life, about other people and about you in the world. And it's worked out very nicely, I have to say. You know, I'm much, I would say I'm a much healthier and healthier and happier person than I was 15 years ago. So would you, would you say that this perspective is perhaps a bit scary to someone who doesn't quite live into that kind of, you know, uncertainty or the space of the many as opposed to the one? Um, but once you sort of step into it, there's a sort of, I don't know, liberation or um, excitement. Like you have to accept it, but once you do, you can sort of, you know, grow into it. Um, it's like, really more, instead of accepting it, mm -hmm. it's, you have to experience it. Mm. It's really not an intellectual process. It's an interesting process. It's really about the experience of putting yourself both intellectually and physically in situations which are uncomfortable and see how far you can get. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, uh, it's so you can do it intellectually, you can do it physically, of course, and, and then you step back and, and analyze how you're feeling. 
is their negativity. Why is there negativity in what you're doing? You know, if you start to try, and this is a very hard thing to do, look at the same problem from a person's opinion that you disagree with and, and try to understand why it is so hard for you to understand that person's point of view and see if you get some insight into what is that person's thinking and, and, and can you get closer to that person by doing that and, and respect her more by doing that. Um, so that is uncomfortable to a lot of people because, you know, we, as I always say, right, we are very tribal creatures and we live within our tribe and we live within our tribe's set of rules, so to speak. And whoever is not part of our tribe is wrong and has to either be converted or destroyed in some literary, you know, not mm -hmm. literal sense, but, uh, well, for some people it is literal, unfortunately. But uh, the idea then is that... Um, by doing that, you are expanding who you are as a person. And instead of bringing fear, it actually brings strength. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so hard for people to understand, that when you become uncomfortable, you're not becoming more fragile, but you're working to becoming stronger. Right? I like that. Um, something you say a lot that I have seen you say in, in your writing is the quest is what makes us matter. Right. And I, I, I find that to be, I find that to be very, very beautiful. What is it in this? Can you unpack a little bit what this mattering is, right? The quest is what makes us matter. I think it ties into what you've been talking about, but it also, it feels very meaningful, right? It feels very spiritual in that sense. Yeah. And it is, um, so I, am, uh, I worked up a proposal for a new book that I'm going to write on meaning. Um, and I don't want to give it all away, but I can tell you that the way our quest for meaning, the way I see our quest for meaning as being important is by looking at, at a sort of uh, interlocked spheres, almost like an Aristotelian universe where at the, very, at the outside is the universe, how we are in the universe. What is the universe for us? How are we part of this thing? And boy, there is a lot to say about that. Then you have a planetary approach where how are we as a species in this planet? Then we have, and I'm not giving away everything, I'm just giving you the hints of what's going on. Then we have the social sphere, where how are we with other people and as social animals and what are we doing? And all of this is related to how, what matters to us as part of the universe, as part of the planet, as part of society. And then at the very core is, of course, you as an individual, right? And all these four spheres are kind of connected to one another and they all whatever you do in one affects what you do in the other ones mm -hmm. and there is a an organic wholeness here um and so when we talk about is the quest that matters is that different people are going to have different quests at these four different spheres some of them don't do anything with one or the other but maybe they should um, because then you have an incomplete view of reality, so to speak, right? Um, but, um, and that's really a very personal choice, but the fundamental point is that you need to always go beyond what you think you're possible, what you're capable of doing, always. Never become comfortable with who you are. And, and who you are means as a person, as a member of society, as a member of the planet, as a member of the universe. And, and whatever mission you're choosing or the quest that you're choosing, it needs to be something that you have joy in doing, even if it's very challenging and hard sometimes. You know? And you're not really looking at, I want to accomplish a, a final goal, but I want to be able to wake up every morning knowing that 
I have one more day to be part of this quest. And once you do that and, and act on these four different spheres, life becomes better. You know, it's a little bit like the old, you know, what the role of philosophy, right? When you say, okay, what is philosophy all about? If you think about it, right? Philosophy is self-help. Mm -hmm. Think about the good life. How do you live the good life? I mean, that is really the core of philosophy. And people kind of forget that, especially continental philosophy, you know, and you start going to analytic philosophy, then it's a little more specific and it becomes an attempt to make it almost like into a science with very specific goals and objectives and technologies and ways of thinking. And, but if you think about certain continental philosophers, then you realize that really this is what's at the core of the whole thing. Mm. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to do is not I'm becoming an older theoretical physicist, I'm trying not to become a very bad philosopher, but trying to actually become a reasonable philosopher and physicist at the same time, which is kind of my quest in a way. And it's not a very easy one, but it's one that makes me smile. You know, and that's really what matters in the end. It is, yeah. I actually, throughout my whole childhood, I wanted to do physics and philosophy. You know, I wanted to understand and I wanted to talk about the good life. You know, and, and actually that, that dream collapsed when I went to Dartmouth and realized that I was totally out of my depth in, in physics. Um, but I absolutely, I absolutely understand that, that impulse. And I'm really excited. That book, probably like 2020, you're thinking? It'll yeah. Come out. Was yeah. About, yeah. I know. These, these things take ages. Yeah, um, it's well, apparently. But um, it's a, it was a, was a commission work. So it's a book for Columbia University Press. Um, and so it's, 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 it's just going to come out and hopefully the sooner the better, we'll see. But there's right. more to come out first. That's really interesting. That's really cool that an academic press is going to publish something for you that's, you know, about meaning. That's really yeah. cool. Which means that somebody's paying attention. You know, yeah. who's editing, you know, the editor of the series, it's a series of books. Mm. Uh, read some of my stuff and said, well, yeah, this is, this makes sense. Let's have uh, this guy, let's, ha let's hear him, so to speak. So, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Well, people should be listening. I think this is a great ending point and you're very busy. And so I'm going to send you on your way. Do you have uh, a, anything that you would like to say and B want to tell us a little bit about where we can find your media and your, you know, read your yeah. stuff. So, um, well, I have, uh, let's see, I have now a lot of different kinds of media channels. If you look at MarcelloGleiser.com, mm -hmm. which is my personal website, there'll be a lot of stuff there. Uh, and you can find me on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, etc. Instagram now, becoming really modern. Mm -hmm. um, and um, trying to do all these things at once so that we have, I realize that nowadays you need to cut the middleman and speak directly to people. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's exhausting though. I mean, like I, I spend hours every day. Yeah. It's hard. It, it's really a full-time job, you know, I mean, for some people. I mean, I am developing a project with a YouTuber from Brazil actually, which is where I grew up, who's one of the biggest YouTubers in the world. He has almost 30 million followers. Um, and, and, and it's his job, it's his life. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and of course it's not mine, but um, <laughs> I tried to push some things. I said, look, it's got to be simple because I don't have a lot of time to do this stuff, but I think it's essential to do it. And so that's my goal right now. I'm doing it and it's growing and I'm kind of excited to see that. Right. Yeah. And, and also solving the mysteries, solving, working on the unending questions of the cosmos. <laughs> you got it. You got it right. <laughs> All right, Steph. Um, thank yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll put up links to all those things so people can find them. Awesome. Okay, okay thank cool. you. And thank I'll talk you. to you very soon. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.